afternoon. Carrie Sundra is an engineer with 20 years of experience working on a variety of projects, everything from livestock thermometers to UAVs. Uh, in her talk today, Carrie takes viewers, you, through all the steps needed to iterate from a first proof of concept to successfully building your first 100 units. Please welcome to the Hackaday stage, sorry, Hackaday Supercon stage, Carrie Sundra. Thank you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm Carrie Sundra of Alpenglow Industries, and I'm here to talk about manufacturing, um, specifically about how to build 100 units without losing your shirt or your sanity in the process, or so we hope. So I've built a lot of things over my career, but the most important thing is that I've built some of my own tools and products that are tools. And um, you might know about like the soldering kits and things that we do, but I also build yarn tools. So these are tools that other yarn dyers use. And uh, I've delivered over a, th a thousand of these tools over the past four years, mostly all throughout the United States, but uh, about 30% of those are international. So we've shipped to about uh, 25 countries, I think. And um, pretty much all of my experience is in this low hundreds to low thousands quantity range, which is kind of tricky because it's expensive to build things in small volumes. Okay, so let's say you've made a thing. Now what? Okay, so you probably have a very small amount of money, a one to three person team, you know, you have yourself, maybe you have one or two other people, and you have a super crappy proof of concept that probably looks like an Arduino with some breadboards and some spaghetti wires in between. Okay, but you're ready, you're ready. You want to make a product out of this, you wanna sell it on the internet, awesome. Uh, so what you need now is you actually need validation that your thing works. It has to leave your shop, it has to go into the hands of other people, and it still has to work. <laughs> and you also need to know that people are going to buy your product at the price that you need to sell your product in order to pay yourself and actually make a living. And then you need somewhat of a plan for production. Uh, how much money do you have to spend to make your first batch? What batch size is that going to be? Uh, what kind of space do you need to make your thing? And uh, you know, how long is it gonna take you to assemble them? Can you do it with just yourself or do you need some more people? So the things to avoid, <laughs> and I'm sure we've all seen some kind of version of this happen. So, you know, you make your thing, yay, you ship 100 units, and then when, once they're out in the real world, there's a functional problem and they all start breaking. <laughs> or, you know, you, your customers thought that it was gonna do this thing over here, but in fact it sort of does this thing over here and they're not too happy about that. Or, it's just way more expensive to build and you realize that the price you're selling it at is not enough to actually make a living and pay yourself. And this leads to this awful downward spiral of lots of people then want their money back and uh, or they are shipping their units back to you for repairs, which is a lot of your time and it's also expensive to ship physical goods back and forth. And then your customers start trashing you on social media. And you know, because everything's costing more, you owe people money, the stress you know, causes a health crisis, you can't fulfill any of your commitments, and then your only recourse is to fake your own death on the internet. I mean, <laughs> so, and, and this has actually happened. Because uh, before there was Kickstarter, there were yarn clubs. <laughs> And so those, those headlines are from uh, one of the more notorious uh, yarn club explosions that did end with the dyer faking her own death on the internet. So how do we avoid, you know, becoming this cautionary tale? Um, one of the things is to just have this perspective in the back of your mind during the design process. Pretend that there is no such thing as return shipping. <laughs> you know, think about, Think about putting something out there and then never seeing it again. And this is also you know, different from software where updates and things are, are often 
are often uh, something that you can do once your product is fielded for a physical good. Uh, it can be really, really, returns are just, uh, returns and repairs are just really expensive. So if you have this in the back of your mind while you're developing something, you will be thinking about things like, okay, well, what could possibly go wrong with every single component that's in this? And how would I go about fixing that? How would I instruct the user to fix that? Uh, are, are my parts user swappable? And this will basically guide you down a path of designing something that is easier for users to repair, which will also probably make it easier for you to assemble as well. So it'll help you out. The other thing uh, that you can do to avoid you know, that awful downward spiral is to use the very best development process. And I will arm wrestle anybody who says that this is not it. And it's not rocket science or anything. Uh, it's just the way that things tend to work when you have humans designing things for other humans. So you have your crappy proof of concept, which you know is that spaghetti wire mess up there. And th this is all, by the way, these are all pictures of the skein twister, which is the main thing, the main yarn tool that I make that I've sold over a thousand of. It's a motorized hook. It's operated by a foot pedal. It helps dyers twist the yarn into a final put-up that you can then like ship or display that won't get tangled. And uh, so, yeah, that was my first crappy proof of concept, and it's a lot of spaghetti wires with a motor and a hook that I got at the hardware store clamped to a table. Second step is prototype. This can actually leave your house. You can actually give it to somebody else to use. Um, usually though that person has like some sort of like vested interest in it, they're going to eventually be a customer of yours, they're maybe a close friend, it's somebody who you can rely on to give you some very, very good feedback. And you know, you can just loan it to them, that's, that's fine. And so the second little picture there, the, the ivory one, is, is my prototype. And it was still a motor clamp to a table, but now there was a box around the electronics. <laughs> um, and you know you can go through a bunch of iterations here. If you if you can, that's great. Um, but in this prototype phase, you're really only building one of something. You're building one, and then you're iterating. You're building one, and then iterating. Um, then there's the pre-production units, and this I think is really the key to doing things efficiently as a small, you know, maybe one-person team <laughs> without a lot of money. Because you basically want to qualify your product and qualify your process as much as you can before you're actually shipping a hundred of these. So the pre-production units, you're going to use every actual part that you intend to use for production. You're going to order your custom parts with your vendors that you've set up to build those custom parts. Um, you're, you know, you're building it like, you're mean, you're, like you mean it. You're treating it as if this was your actual first production run. And uh, doing your beta unit at, doing your beta testing at this point basically lets you reduce risk for not only all of your production, but, um, but also, uh, also for the unit that is as close to the production unit as you can possibly make it. A lot of people try to do um, like big beta tests at this prototype stage, but the prototype changes so much <laughs> between that and production that it's almost like they're delivering a completely new product at the production phase. So as close as you can make those to your, to your actual production units and do your beta test at that point, that will provide you the most value and reduce your risk the most. Okay, so why do we do you know, all of this beta testing? Well, we're trying to ferret out all of the unknown unknowns because you don't know what you don't know until you know it, and you don't know it until you do it. So <laughs> that's, that's, why, that's why we do it at that point. You know, you can, you can have that, you can have that, okay, what could possibly go wrong in the back of your mind, and you can think about everything that you can think about, but the darndest things happen when you give your, your units to your customers. They come up with all sorts of other cool ways to break your stuff. <laughs> um, the beta group is, it's also your secret weapon. So it's, it's absolutely a relationship. 
So not only is this a dry run for you to catch all of your production mistakes, but um, it's also an opportunity to help you market and sell your product. So I also charge my beta customers a, a chunk of money, not the full retail cost of the product because they're still getting like this pre-production unit, but um, you know at least half of what you expect to sell your units for because there's a real big difference in expectations about something that at least I'm given for free versus what I've paid for. So you're gonna get feedback that is much better and much more in line of what your actual production unit customers will have if you actually charge your beta group some money. And that means that they'll also probably use it instead of just sitting on it for a while. Um, and so the other thing that I have the beta group agree to is to provide me with testimonials. And this is especially important if you're new to a market or new to a community. Uh, you know, just establishing some credibility is, is good and known people in the space can help you do that. Uh, they also can definitely help you market. And, you know, reaching people with, you know, a dozen other people's social networks and communities is way better than you can do on your own. And this is important because they will help convince other people to give you money when you're crowdfunding. Because <laughs> sadly, just putting something on Kickstarter doesn't, you know, doesn't result in, in orders. You actually have to get yourself out there and do some marketing yourself and drive people to your crowdfunding campaign. Uh, so people try to shortcut this process a lot and they're like, okay, I got a proof of concept, I'm ready to build 100. <laughs> and it's like, oh yeah, no, no, you're not. <laughs> uh, probably the most common thing that I've seen is that people build prototypes, they do a bunch of iteration on prototypes, and then they kind of wanna skip that pre-production beta qualification stage. And, um, you know, that's happened with, with clients of mine, and what ended up happening is that they didn't really skip that beta unit phase, it was just that their first 100 customers became their beta testers, and suddenly they just had no control over, over that at all. And, you know, they probably spent a year, a year and a half uh, learning things, fixing things, changing things, board spin, which, you know, I was designing the circuit boards, I'm, I'm not perfect, I can't think of every possible thing that's going to happen to this thing once it's used by, you know, 20 people. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of changes and they already had 100 units out there and it is much easier to change something when you only have 10 beta units out there full of people that you've handpicked that are really vested in your, in your product than it is to change something once you have 100 units out there to strangers on the internet who are now like maybe not saying so nice things about you. Okay, so um, there are, there's a lot of information on the next few slides and um, if you, if you catch me at any point during the conference, I'm totally happy to answer questions. I'm just gonna point out a few key points. Uh, your, beta, your beta unit is also a great time to, to test out some of your assumptions. So sneaky and ruthless simplification is my, my favorite thing to do with product development. I like to see if I can get away with not having power switches on my devices, because <laughs> power switches are expensive, they break, they have a limited lifespan, and you know they take time to wire, so they're just expensive all around. And uh, one of my devices, the Skane Minder, had an LCD, and it turns out that people are really bugged when they can't turn an LCD off. And so I needed to provide a way to, to turn it, to, you know, turn the unit off, which was via a long button press, which turned the LCD off and put the processor in low power mode, which probably most of you here knows isn't really off, but it's off enough for most people, so, you know, that's good. <laughs> but then the Skane Twister, it, act, it doesn't have an LCD, it doesn't have a visible LED, and people have not really noticed that there is really no off on it. <laughs> off is unplugging it, and that's fine. So the beta group is a great, great time to test this. 
never ask for their opinion first, like if they want a feature or not, they will always say yes. <laughs> so start with what your uh, goal is, test it out with, on your beta group without telling them, and then if they want it so much that they're willing to complain to you about it, then you know that you'll probably have to include it in your product. Um, other than that, this slide is mostly about shopping. Uh, like most of good engineering is good shopping. We call it part sourcing so that it sounds like cooler. But, um, but it's mostly shopping. It's mostly identifying parts, identifying alternates for parts, and uh, getting a lot of quotes. That hook is a custom hook shape that I had bent. And uh, I got quotes for anything from $25 a hook to $6 a hook. And that's still all just like domestic manufacturers, just the variants. And you know, $6 hooks have been awesome. <laughs> uh, the other thing I want to point out is the don't just think twice, think three or four times between, before getting a cheap pick and place machine or a 3D printer farm. Uh, these are great prototyping tools, but it is very difficult to get consistent results out of them. They tend to be very, very finicky with temperature and humidity. And beware of something that you will spend all of your time just trying to get consistent results out of. Uh, a lot of times it's just better, even if it's like more expensive on a parts cost uh, perspective, it's just better to go with somebody whose job it is to deal with that stuff day in and day out, and you'll get much more consistent and good uh, parts out of that. Um, scaling up is mostly a game of being organized and writing stuff down. <laughs> so uh, do that, make sure all of your digital stuff is organized, uh, keep track of problems that you encounter, keep track of any tests that you do when you're qualifying parts, when you're thinking about you know, I have part A, B, and C, which are all candidates. The tests you do, the results of those tests. There's so many times I haven't write, written those down and had to do it all over again, and yeah, it's, it's really annoying. Especially if, you know, parts shortage uh, comes along and you can't get your first, your first choice part anymore, and you're like, why did we like that second choice one again, and what was wrong with it, why did, yeah. So write stuff down and Keep it, uh, keep it organized and keep everything consistent. Um, okay, so money. <laughs> how, how are you going to get money? I am a fan of crowdfunding, but I am a fan of responsible crowdfunding. So the thing that I think kills most people with crowdfunding is overselling and then under-delivering. It's really all about expectation management and if you're really honest about what your product does and what your customers can expect and you set those expectations up front, then hey, you could always over-deliver and pleasantly surprise them. <laughs> you know, that's much, much better than the, than the alternative and especially if things are going wrong, just be honest. Um, you know, people just don't want to feel like they're being deceived. Um, so that is mostly it. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's, there's a lot more that I could say about a lot of these things. So yes, please, if you have any questions, feel free to seek me out afterwards. But thanks. <laughs>